There are many kinds of ROM chips, or read-only memories, and ROM could refer to a chip that has some data in it that you can only read and, you, and there's no way to write it or change it. So the, the chip is manufactured in a way that it has that data in it. Um, but there's other types of ROMs that are programmable, and those are called PROMs, or programmable read-only memory. Uh, and those get, usually give you some way of, of programming it once. So you get the chip and it's blank, and then you can program it once, and once you've programmed it, then you can't change what's programmed in it, but you can read it as much as you want. And of course that can be inconvenient, so they also make EEPROMs, which are erasable programmable read-only memories. And these usually uh, can be erased by exposing them to ultraviolet light. So this here is, a, is an EEPROM, and you see there's a little window on the top of the chip, and you can see the, the die. And so what, you can program this, and then it's a read-only memory at that point. But you can also erase it by exposing the, the die here to ultraviolet light. So you need some kind of uh, ultraviolet eraser thing to, uh, to erase these. Uh, otherwise, you know, you, you can also you know, leave them out in the sun for a few hours. Uh, sometimes that works, um, which, is, which is why they also have these little stickers that go over top so they don't accidentally erase themselves. So that's a, a erasable programmable read-only memory. But the most convenient kind is the electrically erasable programmable read-only memory, which is what these guys are, uh, which allows you to program them. And then, of course, they act as a normal read-only memory at that point. But then you can also erase them and reprogram them uh, electronically without needing to expose them to ultraviolet light or do anything uh, special. So the 28C16, that's what I've got here. I've got two different 28C16s. This is uh, made by Catalyst. This one's made by Excel. Um, I also have the data sheet over here for the Atmel AT28C16. They're all basically the same. So this is 16,000 bits, which is organized as 2008-bit uh, words, or, eight, or bytes, essentially, 2,000 bytes. It's a parallel EEPROM. And so if we take a look on the data sheet at the pinout here, this is our pinout. It comes in a couple different packages. We have the plastic dual inline package. That's this guy here. It's fairly straightforward. There's basically eight I.O. pins, so 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, so eight I.O. pins, and that's for our data, either their input if we're programming it, and normally they'd be output if we're reading from it. And then there's 11 address lines, so 0 through 7 here, and 8, 9, and 10 over here. And those address lines are used for telling it which byte we want to read, or, or write if we're writing to it, for programming it. And other than that, pretty uh, straightforward. There's ground and, and power for powering the thing. And then there's a write enable, output enable, and chip enable, which we will uh, take a look at in a moment. I'll start by hooking up power and ground. The next pin I'll hook up is uh, pin 18, which is the chip enable. And I'll hook that to ground. And so chip enable is active low, so when this is low, the chip is enabled. And we always want the chip to be enabled, so we'll just tie that directly to ground. Next you'll notice there's eight I.O. lines, so I.O. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. I'm going to hook those up to some LEDs so we can uh, see what's in the chip. So when we, we look at a particular address, we'll be able to see what data is stored in the chip. So I'm going to add some LEDs here that we'll use for looking at what data is in here. All right, so there's eight LEDs that we'll use for looking at the data. Now I'll connect the data pins here, so I.O. 0 uh, is pin 9. I'll connect that. I'll start connecting those to the LEDs. So that's IO0, pin 9, going to the first LED, pin 10 to the next LED here, and pin 11. And then IO3, I'll connect over here to the other side of these LEDs, IO4. So I've connected all these IO lines to the LEDs, so we'll be able to see the output of the chip. But we need to connect the other side of the LEDs over here to ground. And so I'm connecting these LEDs uh, to ground through these uh, 330 ohm resistors. And that's important because this uh, chip doesn't have any current limiting on its outputs. So if we don't have these current limiting resistors here, then it's going to drive as much current as it can through the chip, through the LED, uh, potentially damaging both the chip and the LED in the process. So we don't want that. So we need to do some kind of current limiting. So I've got these 330 ohm resistors that are, that are going from ground uh, through the LED and then into the chip, and so the output of the chip will uh, will, will go through the LED into ground. And uh, these are a little bit asymmetrical because the, the ones on this side are going through the LEDs this way into ground, and the ones on this side are going through the LEDs that way and then to ground. And so these first uh, five LEDs are the other way around. So this should allow us to see what's coming out of these I.O. lines. But in order to do that, we've got to first tell it what address we want to we look at. 
So if we want to read from address 0, for example, we have to set all these address lines to 0. But we want to be able to select which address we're reading from, so what I want to do is hook these address lines up to some switches so we can select whichever address we want. So I'll put some uh, dip switches here that we'll use for setting the address. And I'll hook all the address lines up to those switches. And so that's the first eight address lines here. Address 0 through address 7 are hooked up through to these uh, switches. And when the switches are off, we want the address lines to be low. So I'm going to tie them low with a, uh, this is a 110K resistor, I think. Brown, black, I think that's orange. This is a 10K resistor. So I'm going to tie these, these all low with these 10K resistors. So when the switches are off, these will all be tied low through these resistors. When we turn the switch on, then we want to connect these to 5 volts. So if we hook the other side of the switch to 5 volts, then when the switch is on, the pin will be high. And then when the switch is off, then it's, it's pulled up by that resistor, or pulled down, I guess, by that resistor to ground. So we want the, this side of the switches to all be tied to 5 volts. And so that should take care of the first eight, eight address lines over here. Now, we've still got address 8, 9, and 10 over on this side. So I'm going to add another set of switches here. And we're going to use the, the I guess, the the, the bottom three of these for address 8, 9, and 10, and I'm going to hook them up pretty much the same way. And so that's address 8, 9, and 10 here, 8, 9, and 10, hooked up to this side of the switch. And so again, when these switches are off, we want to pull them low. So I'll do that with these 10K resistors. And then when the switches are on, we want them to be pulled high. And so now we can use these first 11 switches, everything but the top one here, to set our address. And of course, 11 bits of address gives us the 2048, 2048, or two, you know, approximately 2,000 different memory locations. So the only pins we haven't hooked up yet are the write enable and output enable. So output enable is, let's see, pin 20. And if we set that to low, it's active low, so if we set that to low by tying that to ground, then that will enable the output, which means that whatever address we set here will see the contents down here in the, in, on the uh, I.O. lines. So we can try that. We can hook this up to power now. So I'm going to hook this up to 5 volts. And what we see is all 1s. And so that's at address location 0. And if we change this to address 1, we see all 1s. If we go to address 2, we still see all 1s. Address 3, all 1s. And you might be noticing a pattern here, and that's because when these chips are brand new or they're erased, uh, they're erased with 1s in every location. So all 1s means the chip is erased, and there's, there's nothing stored there. And that makes sense because we haven't programmed anything here yet. So to program stuff, that's where the write enable pin comes into play. And to understand how that works, we're going to have to take a closer look at the data sheet. So if we go to page 3, there's this section about byte write, and it says a few things. It says you can use a low pulse on the write enable or chip enable input uh, with the output enable high, and either chip enable or write enable low, respectively, and that initiates a byte write. So what does that mean? Well, you, know, you can read that a few times, and, and there's some more details in there. It also helps to look uh, over on page 6, there's some timing diagrams. And usually the best way to, to understand these data sheets is to read them through, you know, at least a couple times. And, you know, when you're reading it through, it may not make sense entirely what's going on, but as you see other parts of the data sheet, you know, you'll start to kind of get a picture of, of what's going on. And, and so here it is helpful to, to look at this timing diagram, which tells you how to write. And, the, and it turns out there's, there's two ways you can write. You can either write to the chip using the write enable uh, controlled option or the chip enable controlled option. We're going to go with write enable controlled. And basically what that means is that means that the, it's the write enable pin going low and then high that controls the write, that, that, that tells it when to write data. And the way you read these timing diagrams is, is you imagine time going from left to right. And 
there's all these different uh, transitions and things that are going on here. And really what they're trying to do is they're trying to show you the, the parameters for the timing. And all of these parameters are given in this table above. And so, for example, you know, there's this uh, TWP, which is the time of the right pulse. So that's the time from here to here, which is the time that the right enable goes low and then comes back up. So how long is that pulse? Well, time of right pulse, the right pulse width, it says the minimum is 100 nanoseconds and the maximum is 1,000 nanoseconds. So that's good to know. We have to somehow make sure that we keep that within 100 to 1,000 nanoseconds. So that, that'll be important to, to keep, keep an eye on. Some of these other things are basically telling you when this right enable goes low, that's when it's going to look at the address. And when the right enable goes high, that's when it's going to look at the data. And that's sort of corroborated over here in this description here. So it says the, the address location is latched on the falling edge of right enable. And the new data is latched on the rising edge. So the address is latched on the falling edge and the data is latched on the rising edge. And so what this di timing diagram is trying to tell us is it's saying when this falling edge happens here, the address has to be set up prior to that happening. And then after that happens, the address has to be held for some period of time. And so there's a setup time and a hold time for the address. Same thing for the data. When the right enable goes high again, the data has to be set up for some time prior to that, and it has to be held for some time after that. So these are all important numbers to, to be aware of. But you'll notice that like the address setup and address hold, the data setup, data hold over here. So address setup, address hold, there's a minimum, 10 nanoseconds, 50 nanoseconds, but there is no maximum, which is great because we're going to be going pretty slow with this. Uh, so as long as our address is, is toggled into our, our dip switches here, 10 nanoseconds before we try to write, we're, we're going to be fine. And, and of course, that won't be a problem. Uh, and, and as long as we hold it, you know, we don't change the, the dip switches within 50 nanoseconds after trying to write, then we'll be fine. So no worries there. Same thing with the data. You know, when, when we set the data that we want to write, we have to make sure that the data is set up 50 nanoseconds before our write enable goes high. No worries, that's plenty of time. Or, you know, we'll, we'll be much longer than 50 nanoseconds. Uh, and we have to hold it for 10 nanoseconds after this goes high. So no worries there. These minimums, not going to be a problem. Uh, the one thing that might be a little bit challenging is this right, right pulse has to, this pulse has to be somewhere between 100 nanoseconds and 1,000 nanoseconds. And that's not a, a huge window, especially for what we're doing here. Because you might imagine, well, this the right enable pin, which I think is in here, yeah, you can just hook that up to a push button. And you want to write, you push the button. The problem is when you push that button, you're probably going to be pushing it for more than a thousand nanoseconds. That's not very, that's one, one microsecond. That's not very long. And the reality is it's probably okay if it's longer than this, uh, you know, uh, but one thing we can do just to, just to try to, to make it in this window is use a, a, a little RC circuit. So a resistor and a capacitor uh, to, to get this timing right. So for example, if we use a one nanofarad capacitor and I guess I've got a 680 ohm resistor. 680 ohms times one nanofarad is 680 nanoseconds, which falls nicely between here. So I've got a one nanofarad capacitor and I've got a 680 ohm resistor. So how do we build an RC circuit that will generate this pulse that is hopefully 680 nanoseconds? Well, let's get a button here that's going to trigger our pulse. And I'm going to hook my resistor and capacitor here in series with the switch. And I'm going to hook the other side of my switch to ground. And so like this, over here, right at this point here, I'm going to have 5 volts, right? Because I've got a resistor connected across there. And it's not going to drop any current because there's no current flowing. Because the, the switch is closed, nothing's going on. If I close the switch, then current will flow. And now this side of the capacitor will be essentially connected to ground through the capacitor if the capacitor is not charged yet, and this will go down to zero immediately. But very quickly, the capacitor will charge up to 5 volts. And the time that it takes to charge up is dependent on the RC constant here, which is, you know, this is a 1 nanofarad capacitor. This is a 680 uh, ohm resistor, so it should be 680 nanoseconds, which works very nicely. 
When I let go of the switch, this will stay high, and the capacitor will stay charged because it's not connected to anything else. So I'm, I'm going to need another resistor here to discharge the capacitor when I let up the switch. So I'm just going to put in a, uh, this is like a 10K resistor, and that'll, that'll just allow the capacitor to discharge when I'm not pushing the switch. So normally, right now, the capacitor is connected, both sides of the capacitor are connected to these resistors to my plus 5 volts here. So essentially my capacitor just has this series resistor across it, which is discharging it. So the capacitor is going to be discharged. This side over here is going to be 5 volts because there's no current flowing through this resistor, so it's going to be 5 volts on either side. When I push this, then ground is going to be connected here. Current is going to flow through the resistor to charge the capacitor, so this side of the resistor will be zero, but then very quickly rising as the capacitor charges. So this should give me a, a negative going spike when I push the switch, and that negative going spike should be 680 nanoseconds, which is what we want. And so that will be my right pulse because that's going to write enable. And write enable is down here. I believe it's that pin there. So we'll connect that over to write enable. And so now when I push this button, it should give a negative going 680 nanosecond pulse into that write enable pin. We can test that if I hook up power and hook up an oscilloscope probe here, and we'll look at We'll look at this point here, which is going to my right enable. When I push the button, it goes low and recovers here, whereas the capacitor charges. And each of these divisions is 500 nanoseconds. So you can see at this point here, this is 500 nanoseconds. This is 1,000 nanoseconds here. And so we're, we're already up, uh, let's see, so zero volts. One, two, three, four. So we're up over four volts here by the time we get to that thousand nanoseconds. So the period of time that this is low is definitely between uh, 100 nanoseconds, which would be right here, and a and thousand nanoseconds, which is over here. So this is perfect. Okay, so we have that right pulse there. So how do we actually program this thing? So the first thing we want to do is set our output enable to high, which means we're not enabling our output anymore. Uh, which means that our, our outputs over here are now inputs. And so now we, we can set these inputs to whatever value we want to program. And so I'm going to use these little jumpers to set a value here that we want to program into a particular address location. And so let's say this is the pattern I want to program, and I want to put it in address location 0. So I set my address uh, to 0. When I hit the button here, it should now have that programmed into address 0. If I want to program something different into address 1, I can go to address 1, and I can change these around. So I can change to program something different. So I just swapped all the bits, and we'll put that in address 1 by hitting our write enable. And that gives us our nice 680-ish nanosecond pulse to write that into address 1. And we could go ahead and program address 2, 3, 4, whatever. Uh, but for now, we'll just, we'll just do those. And so now if I want to go back to reading, I disconnect all of these, because these are no longer going to be inputs, these are going to be outputs, so I want to make sure those are disconnected. And then I go back for, uh, and set my re uh, output enable from high back to active low, so we're now output enable. And so now you see in address 1, we have this pattern, and if I go to address 0, we have the other pattern that I programmed. And if we go to address 2 or, or 3, we, we still see the all 1s, because I haven't programmed any of, any of those locations. So maybe you're thinking this is pretty cool, but how can we use it to do something a little bit more practical? Well, you might recall this circuit that we put together in the previous video, which basically just takes uh, four bits of input over here and lights up a display to show us the number. So if it's two or three or four uh, or this is C, which is hexadecimal for 12, which is this is binary 12. So we have all this logic just to get this display to work. Well, it turns out you can replace any combinational logic circuit with a ROM. And so rather than having to design this complicated circuit with all of these gates and, and everything going on here, we could replace all of this with a ROM. And that's because, if you remember where this came from, we started with this basic truth table, which just describes how the data bits coming in relate to whether the segments are turned on or off. Well, we could actually program this truth table into a ROM, and these data bits become the address, and then the 
data output of the ROM becomes these, these uh, outputs over here. So at address 0, we could program in 0000001. At address 1 in the ROM, we can program in 1001111 and so forth. And then we could put the ROM in the circuit instead of this. And instead of these switches feeding the input of this uh, fairly compli complicated logic circuit, these switches could feed the address of our ROM. And then the outputs, instead of coming out of the, these collection of OR gates and so forth up here, those outputs would just come directly out of the ROM. So let's give it a try. Let's set our output enable to high, so it's off. And let's go to address zero and just start programming. So first off, we're gonna have all zeros but with a one at the end. So I'll set that to one and then tie the rest of these to ground. And so there we go, and I'll program that. Now we'll go to address one. So that's address 1, program that, and we'll go to address 2. Okay, so if I didn't make any mistakes, which I almost certainly did, that should be everything programmed. So now I'll disconnect all of my connections here, so we're no longer programming, and put it back into output enable mode. And we see three ones and three zeros, which is what we'd expect to see for one, 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 one as our input, which it is. So that's a good verification. And if I switch to other things, I get other outputs. But now the real test will be, let's try hooking the output of this thing up to a seven segment display. So we'll hook the anode here through this 100 ohm resistor to our positive supply over here. And then these bits should go over here. And that doesn't look like a zero. Let's see, what did I do wrong? Oh, I got these hooked up backwards. So the one on the right here is G and I hooked it up to A. So that makes sense. These are all backwards. Yeah, there we go. So zero, we got zero. And now let's try, try it out. Well, there's one. No, nope, that's not two, but we'll keep going. That's three, four, five, Six, seven, eight, nine, A. There's B, C, D, E, and F. So it looks like most everything is right, but it was, what was it, two? Yeah, two is wrong. So two, let's see, what did I do? So two should be zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one, zero. So zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one, zero. So I got that bit off by one. So let me try to fix that. That looks like a two. And real quick, we can just check all the other numbers just to make sure. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, A, B, C, D, E, and F. There we go. So, not super fun to program it using uh, little jumper wires like this, but certainly a lot more fun than uh, designing this whole thing and trying to build this thing. And certainly a lot more flexible too. And you could probably start to imagine how we could use a couple of these for each digit to 
do a you know decimal display or or actually display uh, something more than just a single hexadecimal digit for four bits. But we'll get to that in, in future videos. Uh, the, the thing I want to cover in the next video is actually a much faster way to program these without having to set all these jumpers. Because you can imagine that it gets pretty tedious once you get you know, 256 or, or more values into here. What I want to do in the next video is build a nice programmer for these uh, EEPROM chips. And that's going to be especially useful because we're going to be using a number of these chips, both in the output display as well as in the control logic of our computer.